This video is brought to you by Brilliant. All right, Battlefield 2042. A lot to say on this before we get into the meat and potatoes of this review. First of all, I would caution you against any publication that is putting out a review for this game on this embargo, because no outlet or content creator has had more than around 10 hours with this game during the review period. EA organized three capture sessions spread across three days. It was roughly four hours spent on All Out War, two hours spent with Hazard Zone, and around four hours spent with Portal. These were the only windows made available to reviewers, which is why I don't believe it's possible to slap the review label on this video. This is a review in progress. Furthermore, no one got to access console review code, so no one at all can tell you how this runs on latest gen or previous gen consoles. This is important because I actually got worse performance on PC than I did in the beta, depending on the map, the mode, and the weather effects kicking in. Given that crossplay is available for Battlefield 2042, it would have been possible for EA to allow people to review this game on console alongside PC players, but sadly they did not provide an option for that. The limited timeframes made it very difficult for me to come to any conclusions about the more subjective aspects of this experience, aka, is it fun? Are the specialists well designed? Is hazard mode good? Etc. I mean, sometimes we'd do a hazard mode round and we'd get knocked out super fast and then we'd have to sit in queue waiting for the next one to begin, so I only got a handful of rounds in. Similarly, I only got to see each new map once or twice, I only got to play with each specialist once or twice, I only got to test a handful of weapons, etc. For our portal experience, we kept getting dropped into international servers, resulting in really high ping and awful hit registration. So yeah, there were a lot of challenges inherent in this review process, but I wanted to put something out today because I definitely learnt a lot about this product that EA DICE have made, and I wanted to share that with you in case you were weighing up a day one purchase decision. For example, I learned how it ran on two PCs, a 2080 Ti and an RTX 3090. It's not a great news story to be honest, but there's a lot of detail to unpack there, so I can't even give you a brief summary here in the intro. I learned how much progress has been made in the area of bugs and stability since the beta, and that's a much better news story, since the game does feel less janky here in the release build. I learned about the new maps, and I gotta say that I enjoyed most of them. Orbital, the map we played in the beta, was easily the worst map, so it's a shame that EA DICE chose to lead with that one earlier. I learned how hazard mode works, and I certainly have some preliminary thoughts about how well this all hangs together. It's clear that the entire specialist System was designed with this game mode in mind, as specialists truly shine in this setting. However, I do wonder what kind of legs this game mode will have, sandwiched between Battle Royale offerings like COD and Apex, as well as more hardcore extraction-based offerings like Hunt and Tarkov. Were this game mode free to play, I could see it picking up momentum, but designed as it is and locked behind a paywall, I worry that it'll struggle to find its feet. And Portal, okay listen, Portal is the real deal. Seven classic maps, dozens of classic weapons and vehicles, the classic class system, all of it looking spectacular in Frostbite. This was excellent. The portal creation tools were so impressive, accessible enough that anyone could spin up their own custom game easily, but deep enough that advanced users could script specific rule sets to create entirely new game modes altogether. There's a narrative out there that Battlefield 2042 is all about the dollars, that this specialist system and hazard zone all exist so that EA can monetize Battlefield more easily, and that's really the only reason that Battlefield 2042 exists the way that it does. My 10 hours with the game really convinced me that this wasn't the case. If monetization was the only driving force behind Battlefield 2042, if that was the only thing EA DICE cared about, you never would have got Portal, no way. It really does feel like the love letter they promised it would be, and I really respect EA DICE for including it this year. Based on my brief time with the game, I think Battlefield 2042 is a very ambitious package that genuinely does provide a lot of stuff for your $60 three distinct game types, 13 maps, dozens and dozens of new and old weapons and vehicles, and a sophisticated game mode editor. I don't think any Battlefield game has offered this much on day one. But it's clear to me that this product is still not finished, and that you're going to be better served by waiting to pick it up later on. There are still way too many technical issues present, and they're going to take time to fix. Most of the design issues I talked about in the beta remain unchanged here, and addressing those will take time. 
As for Hazard Zone, a lot of work is going to be needed to get this thing really humming if it's going to compete with similar offerings, and that too will take a while. Battlefield 2042 is trying to appeal to both a new and an old audience, and it reaches for a lot in its attempt to do that. Unfortunately, EA DICE just haven't been able to wrap their arms around it all before launch, and 2042 feels like it sags under the weight of its own ambition. 12 months from now, I think this will be awesome, but right now, I think it's better to sit this one out. Talking about the performance of Battlefield 2042 on PC is complex because performance fluctuates wildly based on which map you're on, how many players are on that map, and what sort of weather effects are active. I tested Battlefield 2042 on two PCs, both of which were running at 1440p. The first was an RTX 2080 Ti with an AMD 3700X. This is, of course, a powerful PC that can handle most games well when played at 1440p ultra settings. The second PC is an RTX 3090 and an AMD 3950X. That is a very powerful PC, which I typically use for editing and capture, but I used it for this review because I wanted to see how Battlefield 2042 would run on basically the best hardware money can buy. The day one capture session was All Out War, which is 128 people playing both Conquest and Breakthrough on a five map rotation. We didn't get to see the Arctic breakaway map that day. I started on the 3090 machine and it was not good. Running at 1440p, ultra settings, DLSS off, ray tracing off, I was generally sitting at around 70 to 80 FPS with regular frame drops down to around 50 FPS. You might say, well, you hit 60 FPS, what's the problem? Well, firstly, this computer is pretty damn powerful and not being able to hit at least 100 FPS is kind of a problem. Secondly, much like the beta, it was the inconsistency of the frame rate that was the major concern. If I was getting a solid 70 FPS, I could probably live with that, but the fluctuations made the whole thing feel so slippery. Gunplay in this game mode feels significantly worse than gunplay in other game modes because the performance is so sloppy, a topic we'll come back to later. I worked hard to improve the frame rate. The first step was to alter my settings. What I learned was that dropping settings would significantly reduce how good the game looked, but would only marginally increase performance. At 1440p, DLSS off, ray tracing off, and low settings, I was getting an average of around 90 frames a second on an RTX 3090. That is not good. My next test was to see what sort of uplift DLSS would provide here, since that was absent in the beta build, and DLSS can provide a really big increase. I mean, in games like Guardians of the Galaxy or Outriders or Control, DLSS can almost double your frame rate. Here though, in Battlefield 2042, it does basically nothing. Running at 1440p, ultra settings, DLSS set to performance, ray tracing off, I got a slight increase in frame rate, moving from an average of 70 frames up to around about 80. I didn't notice any more stability. More detailed analysis will reveal the exact numbers behind all of this, but from my perspective, DLSS did not have an appreciable impact on average frame rate or stability, which was a real bummer. I also tried to use the ultra performance mode for DLSS just to see what it would do, but this is not meant to be used at 1440p. It's meant to be used at 8K resolution, which is why it's essentially unusable here because it creates far too much image degradation. Next up was ray tracing. Battlefield 2042 does come with ray traced ambient occlusion, providing more accurate fill lighting. I'm gonna say that this feature is dead on arrival at least it was for me. Turning it on with DLSS off tanked my frame rate down to like less than 50 frames a second and it would drop as low as 35 sometimes. Turning DLSS on to auto seemed to push DLSS to the ultra performance setting since I was noticing the same image degradation I was getting earlier. This tells me that DLSS knew that the system was struggling so it threw absolutely everything at it to try and get the frame rate up. When I set DLSS to performance, ray tracing on, I still could not crack 60 frames a second. Turning all other settings to low made no difference by the way. I could not get above 60 frames a second with ray tracing enabled no matter what I did on an RTX 3090. So long story short, top of the line hardware, 1440p ultra settings, it's capping at around 80 FPS with regular frame drops, DLSS makes no difference and ray tracing is essentially unusable. I was so stunned by these results 
results that I went and checked with other people on similar hardware and they too reported similar findings. I even saw people posting in the tech support channel in the Discord we were using and they were experiencing the same stuff I was. At the same time, I spoke to a few people who were reporting really solid performance when playing at 1080p or on older GPUs like the 10 series. This lines up with what I noticed in the beta, which is that Battlefield 2042 seems to be better optimized for low-end hardware at this point. So as I said, I tested this on an RTX 2080 Ti as well. Basically everything I said about the 3090 performance, you can apply to the 2080 as well. Just subtract around 10 frames a second. Frame rates are still low and inconsistent. DLSS does nothing and ray tracing is unusable. In fact, I think I was getting around 25 frames a second when I was using ray tracing on the 2080 Ti. This was useful data to me because it told me that there probably wasn't anything wrong with my 3090 setup and that the problem was with Battlefield itself. So obviously this performance sucks, but here's where it gets complicated. Day two was Hazard Zone. This mode is capped at 32 players on PC. This runs beautifully. On the 3090, I was sitting at an average of around 110 frames a second, and it was pretty solidly locked there. Sure, I would have liked to have gotten more frames, but I'm not gonna complain at that point because 100 plus is fine. But more importantly, it was consistent. This game as a whole felt better to play in this game mode. Gunplay felt substantially better here because performance was so vastly improved. I had similar findings on day three where we tested our portal. There we were playing game modes capped at around 64 players and we were playing on older maps that were less graphically dense like El Alamein. I was generally sitting at around 100 frames during these sessions, even when the action was thickest. Clearly the 128 player count, the random weather effects and the more detailed map design are all wreaking havoc on performance and a huge amount of work is needed to get this thing running well. Right now, All Out War is easily the worst way to play this game because it runs so badly and the gameplay itself feels worse as a result. Finally, I'll conclude this section by reminding you that no one knows how this will run on consoles and given what I saw here on PC, that's definitely a concern. Beyond performance, the three day review period gave me the chance to see how far the game has come in terms of bugs, glitches, netcode, etc. I think a lot of ground has been made here. The stop motion animation that occurs when vehicles explode, that's gone. Animation glitching was generally far less common. I noticed fewer enemies frozen in place. That weird teleporting thing that helicopters and planes would do when they were too distant, that was gone. The parachute glitches were gone. The whole thing was definitely tidier. There's always gonna be Battlefield jank that's kind of hard-coded into Frostbite, but on the whole, there's nothing I'd point to now as really broken or alarming except audio. Okay, so audio in Battlefield 2042 is fucked. <laughs> in the beta, I commented that the soundscape was so vacant and eerily silent. I think they fixed that, as I certainly never noticed the same windows of quiet or the sound mix not properly reflecting the chaos erupting around me when I was playing during this review period. What replaced that issue though, is the worst positional audio I've ever experienced. I remember when COD Warzone first launched, it got dragged for having terrible positional audio, and it did, but it was nothing compared to this. The sound of gunfire and explosions and footsteps, you can't discern where things are or how far away they are based on their audio. Footsteps in particular, it constantly sounds like there's someone right next to you and you're like whipping around left and right and there's just no one there. It's a problem on the bigger maps, but less noticeable. On smaller maps though, where everyone is tightly packed in, it's, it's frankly unusable. Like it actually makes this game way harder to play when this positional audio is messing with your head like this. Truly awful, and I don't know how easy it is to fix this by the way, because it took COD Warzone a long time to get this right. So I guess we'll have to wait and see on that one. Okay, so bottom line, performance is still very bad and needs a lot of work, at least on PC. Console, we've got no idea and the game is less buggy than the beta, except in regards to audio, where things are way worse. I'm gonna come back to this point a few times in this review, but I don't think right now is the time to play Battlefield 2042. Following in the rich tradition of previous Battlefield releases, EA DICE have their work cut out for them to finish and polish this game. If you have patience enough to be able to wait 6 or 12 months, you're gonna be able to step into this experience when most of this stuff has been ironed out, hopefully. All right, so that's all the performance stuff out the way. So let's talk about how fun Battlefield 2042 actually is. Is 
I'll premise this entire section by reiterating what I said at the start, which is that we got such a limited amount of time with each of Battlefield 2042's three major game modes that it's impossible to reach any definitive conclusions about anything, really. These are just some first impressions about stuff, as well as some info dumping when required, since I know people have a lot of questions about Hazard Zone and Portal in particular. Day one of the review event was All Out Warfare. This is the signature Battlefield experience, dropping up to 128 players onto gigantic maps where they can kill each other over and over again with a huge variety of weapons, vehicles, and gadgets. We started the event in a mode called Breakthrough, which is basically Rush, except without having to plant a bomb. You just have to capture points, and more of the map will open up as you do that, with the defending force being pushed back further and further with each successful capture. This was fun, but we definitely hit some stalemates at different points owing to map design and how many players were on the map at once. This map here is called Renewal and it's set in Egypt. Its first section works pretty well, but after that we have to cross this massive span of no man's land with no cover and the enemy dug in at the other side and the invincible helicopters flying overhead just mincing us whenever they saw fit. We could not break through here. It definitely made me wonder how well this game mode is going to work since you're essentially funneling 128 people into one spot where Conquest would at least see that player base spread out quite a bit. It certainly didn't feel good here, but I can't say if that was because our team was bad or because the map was bad or who knows, we didn't have enough time on it. Eventually we'd move over to Conquest and the game flowed much better there. It's exactly the same Conquest we've been playing forever only now with way more players. I really thought about this increased player count while I played, and I asked myself, what are we getting for that? And I'm not sure that we're really getting anything, because the maps are so large and so spread out in Conquest, you never feel like you're on the battlefield with 127 other people. It just feels kind of the same as when it was with 64 people. In Breakthrough, you do feel the impact of it, but I'm not sure the impact is good. 128 players is an interesting bullet point to put on the box, but certainly in the case of Conquest, I don't feel as though it's translating through to a more epic experience, and given the performance costs associated with it, I wonder if it was the right goal for EA DICE to have set for themselves here. All of that's before the issues with the AI, by the way, who I spoke about them in the beta impressions video. Uh, yeah, man, there's a lot of them on the battlefield at any point in time, and I'm sure that's going to become an issue. And the post-launch period, once people move away from the game, they don't add anything. They're just fodder, and killing them feels so unsatisfying. And, uh, I, yeah, I, I really, really, really dislike the presence of so many AI bots on the field at any one time. I will say that I quite like the maps. The cargo container field manifest, the cityscape of Kaleidoscope, and the ruined shipyard of Discarded were all excellent, actually, with some great indoor and outdoor combat environments that led themselves to the sort of tense showdown that Orbital was really struggling to provide. You can never predict which maps will become community favorites, but I would say that Orbital was the exception to what looks like overall solid map design. Day one was where we got to go hands-on with the full roster of Battlefield 2042 specialists. Now I'm going to say that in Conquest and Breakthrough, I really do not like specialists. I don't like the abilities they provide because they feel kind of cheesy and immersion shattering. I don't like how flexible their kits are because it reduces their identity, and I don't like the way they replace a class system that has long underpinned Battlefield. So let's unpack that. So specialists are defined by their active abilities as well as their passive trait. So the grapple bro, McKay, has a grapple that can pull him up pretty much anywhere, and his passive is that he moves faster while aiming. There's Boris, who could drop a turret that auto-targets enemies and spots them so they become visible through walls and shreds them really fast if it manages to lock on, and it acquires targets even faster if Boris is nearby. There's another operator named Pike, who can just see through walls with a press of a button, and she also auto-spots anyone that shoots her. Now, I don't know if this is just old man yells at Cloud, but I don't think this belongs in Battlefield. It just felt super cheesy to drop a turret, sit behind cover and farm kills, like fucking Torbjorn. Uh, instant free wall hacks in a Battlefield game, that's not really what I'm there for. When I think Battlefield, I think immersion. I mean, go back and play Battlefield 1, which I've actually gone back to playing recently, actually. It is incredible how immersive that game feels, despite the fact that it is absolutely not a realistic recreation of World War 1 combat. A game doesn't need to be realistic to be immersive, and Battlefield has always walked that fine line. It topples here in Battlefield 2042 under the weight of these specialists. I really did feel like I was playing big scale, realistic looking Overwatch more than I was playing a Battlefield game. And that's a common talking point that you see all over salty Reddit threads and whatever, but it's true, I did. I felt that, 
I had fun, sure, but it made me kind of sad to know that Battlefield has gone in this direction because it's abandoning that commitment to immersion that I've always really loved about this franchise. The other thing that the specialist system abandons is teamwork. Again, here in All Out Warfare that is. We'll come back to Hazard Zone later. Any specialist can still pick any weapon, any gadget. I still can't see which weapons or gadgets my teammates are bringing, so I can't coordinate around that. There is a communication-based ping menu now in place, but it's very basic, it's very clunky to use, to be honest. Because everyone can be everything, you're pushed more towards a self-sufficient style of play, because that's what everyone else is doing. This problem is solved in Hazard Zone, where you're forced to coordinate your loadout and playstyle choices in the pre-game, but it's unsolved here in All Out Warfare because the game's UI, its social systems and communication tools are not sophisticated enough to allow players to work together easily. Finally, specialists replace classes, and I think losing classes was such a mistake. It's funny because what they've done since the beta is that they've clustered each of the specialists under a class label like Assault or Recon or Support or Engineer, but they haven't done anything else. It's literally just a label that's slapped on them like an awkward band Band-Aid. Those words don't mean anything because these specialists aren't analogous to classes because their kits lack the identity that the classes had. Specialists just don't feel like they belong in Conquest or Breakthrough, a point that became really clear to me on day two when we got to spend some time with Hazard Zone. There was a rumor during the rounds that Battlefield 2042 started out its life as a battle royale title, but late in development they pivoted to also include a more traditional Battlefield experience. I don't really believe that story, but I do believe that Battlefield 2042 was built from the ground up around Hazard Zone, since it's here that most of the head-scratching design decisions I encountered in Conquest started to make sense. In case you weren't aware, Hazard Zone is a PvP experience capped at 32 players. In pre-made or match-made teams of four, you're dropped onto a predetermined spot on the map. After you touch down, you'll face off against enemy AI bots as well as other players to extract data drives from fallen satellites. You'll have two opportunities throughout the round to extract those data drives, one in the middle and one at the end, and the more drives you extract, the more dark market credits you earn. Those can be spent at the start of the next round on weapons, gadgets, and other upgrades, giving you an advantage over players who aren't packing a similarly weighted arsenal. You do lose all of your gear when you die though, meaning you'll have to repurchase it next round. Each round becomes its own gamble then. Do you spend big on valuable weapons and gear but risk losing it all, or do you use free or cheap equipment because you'd like to save those dark market credits for later? I played this in a squad of four on a variety of maps and immediately the teamwork that Conquest was lacking was present here. You're presented with a specialist selection screen at the start of each round and you're limited to one type of specialist per squad, so you can't bring two shield bros for example. That in itself forces you to start thinking about what you want to bring to the table and how you want to play. Next, you'll select weapons, either the free options, or you'll spend cash on better, modified weapons, including scopes and extended mags, etc. Again, you're going to want to coordinate with your team about who might snipe versus who might be packing a close range weapon. Next, you'll choose gadgets. Who of you will bring ammo packs, med packs? Who will bring the scanner to help you find data drives off in the distance? Finally, you'll be able to bring some tactical items that can provide further upgrades to your squad, and you're going to want to coordinate with each other for an optimal loadout. In this way, you're defining a class role here because you're carving out a specific contribution to the team. When you get on the ground, the specialist loadouts combined with all of your other choices are given space to shine. Because skirmishes are typically against a small number of enemies, you're really able to think about where you should deploy that defensive barrier, or when you might advance with your shield, or where might be a good spot to reposition as the grapple bro. In Conquest, it's just a clusterfuck. You don't get to make those decisions in the same way. Here you're making them all the time and it became clear to me that this is why the specialists were designed the way they were, with their specific abilities and with all the freedom they have to select any weapon or any gadget. All of that exists to enable this tactical squad based decision making in Hazard Zone. The game mode itself is good, I like it. I think it's going to need many more months of balancing to get right. The economy right now will leave less skilled players severely disadvantaged because the number of free weapons and gadgets is so limited. This is similar to Hunt Showdown but it's it's very different in one key aspect. Gear is far less impactful in Hunt because mastery of the map is more important than gunplay. You might be facing off against a fully geared enemy in Hunt, but if you know how to use cover or listen to the audio cues the environment gives you or manipulate PvE enemies to your advantage, you can absolutely outplay your opponent. 
that's not the case here. These environments are so open and so lacking in cover that if you find yourself exposed and you don't have a scope on your weapon, but your enemy does, then you are basically fucked. When I learned that this game mode would be played out on the same maps that Conquest was being played on, I was worried and my time with the game mode really confirmed a lot of those concerns. I don't think these maps are the right maps for this type of game mode and I wonder if EA DICE will look to add specific hazard zone maps in the future. More broadly, I wonder how this will do in the market. This is absolutely nowhere near hardcore enough to pull over Hunt or Tarkov players and it's locked behind a $60 paywall, which completely closes it off to the Battle Royale players currently occupied by free-to-play Warzone and Apex. Then there's Halo coming out in a month, totally free to play. I remember when Call of Duty Blackout was released, it was their first swing at Battle Royale. Now that died in like a month for a variety of reasons, but in large part because the business model wasn't the right one. Compare that now to Warzone, which is absolutely gigantic. I think that Hazard Zone has potential, but I think that it's gonna need a lot more time in players' hands before it really hits its stride. And I think that if you wait a bit, you're probably gonna get it for free because this business model, I don't think this will last. So far, I've not painted a particularly compelling picture of Battlefield 2042, but don't worry, I did save the best for last. Portal is a very special offering that I think is going to win Battlefield 2042 a lot of goodwill. It's such an earnest attempt at paying tribute to Battlefield's rich history while giving players so many options to invent a new future for it as well. Portal is two things really. It's the chance to make interesting game modes pulling from the maps, weapons, vehicles, gadgets and classes of previous Battlefield games and it's also the chance to easily play those things should you have no interest in making any of that content. There are six maps on offer from Battlefield 1942, Bad Company 2 and Battlefield 3 and all of them have been reconstructed in Frostbite so they look amazing. EA DICE have also said that they've made some minor improvements to these maps to make use of modern day tech and better deliver on the original intention of each map but they didn't specify what those changes were. We started off by playing a custom game which was built in the portal editor. It was called VIP Escort and basically one person on the other team would be highlighted as the VIP and we had to hunt them down. The first team to score 15 VIP kills wins. It was essentially a modified team deathmatch mode played on Arika Harbor from Battlefield Bad Company 2 and it was super fun, frustrating positional audio aside. Next, we would be walked through the impressive portal creation tools, which exist as a web-based platform you access through your browser. There are a number of starting points for your edit, such as choosing which Battlefield game you'll be basing it on and which maps and modes you'd like to start with. But after that, you can edit a huge range of modifiers, like the number of players on a team, spawn timers, movement speed, how spotting works, etc. You can also select which Battlefield classes and specialists are available to each team, and even go as granular as to pick or ban specific weapons or specific specific weapon mods, same for vehicles. It was just crazy how much customization is possible here. After that, we were shown the logic editor, which allows people to create custom game rules. The developer built a game mode for us where we each spawned with one rocket, and to get a rocket back, we had to jump five times. So you can imagine all of these tense 1v1s where people would fire off their one rocket and then just start jumping up and down in a mad attempt to reload, and then it was boom time again. We only saw a tiny, tiny fraction of what was possible with Portal, but it was clear that these tools are so good that the sky is the limit for what the Battlefield community can do with this. Can you imagine the Battlefield friends getting their hands on this shit? That is content I would watch. The community created ecosystem that is possible with these tools is astounding. But at a more basic level, Portal also exists as a way to just go back and play the older Battlefield games, which is what we did at the end. There are classic playlists you can hop straight into, and so we played Conquest on El Alamein and the Battle of the Bulge and Rush on Arica Harbor. It was with the old classes and weapons and gadgets and squads that worked together to repair tanks and keep each other fed with ammo and med packs. It was the best part of the entire three days for me and for others as well because I spoke to a bunch of people and yeah, everyone loved this stuff. Battlefield 2042 is a really interesting product and I can't think of another like it. It's simultaneously aware of its great storied history and its massive, loyal, devoted fan base. But it also seems to think that the classic Battlefield formula is no longer enough 
And if Battlefield is to survive and thrive into the long term, then it needs to welcome a new type of player, one reared on Rainbow Six Siege and Overwatch and PUBG and Call of Duty and Apex. I don't know that Battlefield needed to evolve in that way. I think there is an enduring appeal to the Battlefield formula that this year's rendition of All Out Warfare doesn't quite capture. I think the immersion factor is sorely lacking, as is the squad-based team play. That still exists through the magic of Portal, but it's somewhat sad to know that this classic Battlefield formula feels like it's now in DICE's rearview mirror. No one knows how this Battlefield will fare in the long term because there's so much in this package that some part of it might really click with the community and go gangbusters, while another part might completely die on the vine. Only time will tell. In the immediate though, I think it's wise to sit back and see what the answers to those questions might be. Currently, the game lacks the technical polish that would make it pleasant to play on day one, and it's clear that both All Out Warfare and Hazard Zone still need a lot of design work put into them to help them reach their potential. Similarly, it's going to take months for the community to wrap its arms around what's possible in Portal and for the most beloved new and old modes to establish themselves. Battlefield has a long tradition of hitting its stride 12 to 18 months after its release, and I think that remains the case here as well. Battlefield 2042 has ambition in spades, but it's going to take more time for that ambition to be fully realized. Don't you wish this was you? Okay, maybe not exactly this, but don't you wish you had a galaxy brain and you could crush complex mathematical or scientific problems between your beefy synapses? Look, I know that's not how synapses work, but just go with it, okay? So this is brilliant, and it's a platform that helps you get better at all the stuff you probably just zoned out over when you were back at school. Stuff like science, technology, engineering, mathematics, computer science, physics, and more. Back then I was like, uh, science is so boring, when am I ever gonna use this stuff? And now I'm staying up till 2 a.m. watching Neil deGrasse Tyson videos on quantum physics, just thinking to myself, damn, I really wish I understood half of what he was saying. Brilliant is your chance to understand half or more of what he's saying. It offers a huge range of courses ranging from beginner level to advanced study. Each of the courses clearly explains the concepts and provides an interactive element so you're always learning by doing. Courses are always broken up into manageable sections so you can do them all at once or across a few sittings. You can also do them on mobile since they have a dedicated app that has a 4.6 rating with over 70,000 reviews on the Android store alone. Coming back to my butchered beefy synapses metaphor, Brilliant is like a workout for your brain. Expanding your mind by learning entire new things or delving deeper into the sorts of mathematical logic or computer programming challenges that will keep you feeling sharp. To learn more, visit brilliant.org forward slash skill up and as a special offer, the first 200 people to sign up get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Thanks Brilliant for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it. Thanks for watching my video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down so I know to do better for next time. If you enjoyed yourself, consider subscribing. And if you really enjoyed yourself, maybe consider hitting that notification bell so you never miss a video. You can see my patrons here on the left. They're awesome. They're amazing. If you want to join them, check out my Patreon page. Thank you again. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.